There's a lot of different ways that a species is defined and the biological species concept is really just one of these definitions. With the biological species concept, we're talking about individuals that can reproduce and not only can they reproduce, but they can reproduce and make viable offspring. When we look at some of the species around us, so the human species, it's clear to us that humans are different from anything else on the planet. So we automatically just say, well, that's a species. Well, there's more to it than that because humans, although there's a great diversity there to humans, they can interbreed with each other and those offspring are going to be able to produce offspring of their own. So that's what we mean by viable. Their offspring will be fertile. They can produce additional fertile offspring. So if you have a female on one side of the earth and you have a male on the other side of the earth and we're talking about humans, those two may look very, very different from each other, but there's not really any question in our mind that if both of those are healthy individuals that they could mate and they could produce children that are going to be viable, healthy offspring. If we look around us, we can see species that we know are distinct from each other and we already know that those two are not going to be able to breed with each other. Um, in this picture, we have a little example. So we know that the monkey and that bird are not gonna be able to produce viable offspring. But it's not always such a clear cut case. You may have two birds that look very similar to each other, but they're not producing offspring. You may have two fish that look very similar to each other. So there are what we call reproductive barriers. And these reproductive barriers are going to prevent um, distinct species from producing offspring. So here we have what we call pre-zygotic barriers and post-zygotic barriers. We can break those barriers, the barriers that we have into these two categories. So keep in mind that the way that fertilization and new species are, or new offspring are produced is that we have an egg from a female, we have a sperm from a male, those two combine through the process of fertilization and then what we end up end up with is what we call a zygote and that zygote is the first cell that makes up this new individual. So that's our new offspring, the zygote. So if you look at these barriers, we have what are called pre-zygotic. So this is before the zygote. So these are things that would block um, the process before the zygote is formed. And then we have post-zygotic barriers, which are going to be after the zygote. So these might be things that would then affect the viability of that offspring if it was actually produced. So to say it a little plainer, we have mating then we would have fertilization and then the next step would be development of the zygote. If we disrupt this process anywhere along the way then this is going to work against making that a species or against those species breeding with each other and producing viable offspring. So let's first take a look at what we call the prezygotic barriers. The prezygotic barriers are going to prevent mating from taking place. Okay, so there's a number of ways that this can occur. And if we look at some of them, in this picture here, um, this is representing what we call habitat isolation. Okay, so that's one possibility. These um, two fish, very similar to each other if you just look at them in the picture here and you might think from just looking at them that they're even variations of the same species we just have some different colors there so at first glance it may not be clear that they're not going to breed with each other but these are isolated by living in different locations there's a strip of land in between the two of them so since they are located in different um, places they're not even going to come into contact with each other and have the opportunity to mate. So we're going to call these distinct species because they don't mate with each other because they're located in different places. Another type of 
um, barrier that's prezygotic is represented here and this is going to be a temporal barrier and by temporal barrier what we're saying is that these three species their mating takes place at different times so on the bottom here we have a month chart okay so we're showing all the months of the year and if the species prefer to mate at different times, it doesn't really matter if they're located in close proximity to each other, if they're coming into contact with each other on a daily basis, they're not ready to mate concurrently. So this is another way to isolate species from each other before the mating even takes place. This picture here, um, we're just showing you that sometimes there can be mechanical prevention. So here we've got um, a very large frog and we have a very tiny one. Okay, so those two may look like similar individuals. They may live in the same place, but mechanically it just isn't going to work for those two to reproduce or copulate with each other. So we don't expect in that case to get any reproduction or mating and viable offspring from the pairing. And then the last example that we have right here is maybe there's just a difference in their behavior. So we can have behavior isolation. Behavior. In this case, we've got um, a mate preference that has occurred. So we have um, in this picture little dinosaurs and maybe the blue ones decided that they only want to mate with blue ones now and maybe the green ones, they only want to mate with green ones. So if that's the case, even though they're living in close proximity to each other, they just are not interested whatsoever in the other individuals. And so they're just looking for someone that is similar to them or like them, and that will be their choice for mating. So notice that every one of the examples that we've listed here, the end, the individual organisms are not mating with each other for some specific reason. So if they don't mate altogether, then we don't have to worry about formation of the zygote at all. There are also a number of mechanisms in place that prevent successful fertilization. So this means that even if the egg and sperm come into contact with each other, they're not going to fuse and combine to form that zygote as we would expect in the normal situation. This can often be called gametic isolation. There may be chemicals involved in this that prevent the two from recognizing each other so that they don't combine with each other. Um, so you might have pollen from one tree that is trying to fertilize or coming into contact with the egg of another tree. And just because they don't recognize each other, we're not going to get the combining of the gametes as we would expect. All of these things that we just discussed do fall under that category of prezygotic barriers because these are barriers that are going to prevent the fertilization combining of the two different gametes from really taking place. We also have what we call post-zygotic barriers. So again, this is after formation of the zygote. So here we're saying that you do actually get the combining of the egg and the sperm. So you are going to get an initial zygote. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get a viable offspring. So keep in mind that the key here is that not only do we get um, mating to take place, but we also want a viable offspring. Not only one that's going to survive, but one that's going to be able to produce offspring. In this picture, this, I don't know if you've seen these or heard of these before, but this is what we call a liger. And if you think about the word liger, perhaps you can figure out um, what that stands for, or just looking at this organism, you can see what it stands for. But what we have is we have a lion, crossed with a tiger. This is a real species. It's not a made up picture here. Sorry, it's a real um, organism. It's not a made up picture. You can get lions and tigers to mate with each other and that mating can be successful. You can get formation of a zygote and that zygote does develop into an organism. Okay, so we can see that in the picture here.
The problem is that this organism, this liger, is not able to reproduce its own offspring. So the male ligers are actually sterile. Okay, so if they're sterile, the males, you're never going to have reproduction of a male liger and a female liger with each other because we're missing half of the equation. The female ligers, they are fertile, but they're not going to be able to mate with the male liger, so they can only mate with a tiger or a lion. So in this case, we have an example of a breakdown in the process. We cannot get those offspring that are able to sustain that um, new combination. Another common example, and this one I'm sure you've seen before, is that we can have a mating between a horse and a donkey. Okay, very similar organisms when you look at the two, a horse and a donkey, they can come together, we can mate them, that zygote does, fo does um, form, it does develop into an offspring which we call a mule. That mule though is not going to be able to produce offspring of its own. So you can't take a mule and mate it with another mule and expect to get um, little mules. Okay, not gonna happen that way. So these are just a couple examples of the breakdown that takes place after we have that um, fertilization process and then have the zygote formed. So the breakdown may occur in the actual development of the zygote. We may not get the zygote developing whatsoever. And then the other option is that if the zygote develops, as is the case with the liger and the mule, we don't get fertile offspring from the pairing. So those are the ways that we typically define species when we use the biological species concept. However, there are some problems with all of this because what if you're just looking at fossils, for example? If we're talking about old species, they may just be fossils. So we may not be able to even look at whether those two similar looking organisms would have been able to mate with each other would they have been able to produce viable offspring? There's really no way to know if we're just looking at a fossil. Another problem here is that many species are asexual. So they reproduce asexually on a regular basis. This may be pretty much all we view those species as doing. And if it's asexual reproduction, again, we can't really evaluate whether they are successfully able to reproduce with each other and produce viable offspring with each other. So this is not um, an all-inclusive way to define a species. It works in a lot of cases, but there are some issues with it. Because of this, there are some alternative um, concepts or species concepts that are proposed. They all have good and bad things about them. So if we just look at and talk briefly about some alternative ways to define species. One of them is the morphological species concept. In this case, we can just um, say that similar looking things get grouped together. One of the problems with this is that this is so subjective. Who is to say how similar organisms have to be to each other to get grouped together in the same species? What is enough difference to put them into two separate categories? So it's not perfect either. Um, this does, however, work for fossils. You could look at fossils and you could say those two are very similar, so we're gonna call them the same species. And it does work for asexual organisms as well because again, you can look at them and you can see whether they look similar or not. So it does help cover some of those problems that we had with the biological species concept, but not perfect. The ecological species concept talks about what they actually do or what their habitat is. So if they perform similar um, roles in the environment, if they have similar niches, similar food sources, these types of things, then we can group them together as a species. Again, a little subjective. We can't use this when we're talking about fossils, obviously. So not perfect. We can also talk about the phylogenetic species concept. This one um, dives into the ancestry of the organisms. So if we're talking about this one, we would look for the most common ancestor. So we could say that 
all of the species, all of the individuals that evolved from a common ancestor, maybe we lump all of those together as a species. Very hard to decide a lot of times what the most common ancestor is, or again, how far back do we take um, the tree or how far forward? Um, where do we want to actually cut it off and say this is going to be a new species? Or do we come up with a very broad category that we know all developed from the same ancestor and lump them into the species? So as we talk about species, we're going to go through how we get new species now. But keep in mind that we're really going to focus on the biological species concept. It is the most common one that's used. But also know there are other ways to define a species for sure. So how do new species arise? How do we go from two individual organisms that might be reproducing with each other just fine to ultimately getting two separate species that no longer are able to reproduce and get those viable offspring. Okay, and there's two different main pathways that we can get these new species arise. And we're starting to see a little bit of it on this picture. We can have an isolation that takes place, as you see on the left-hand side, or we could get um, species that develop right there in close proximity to each other. So the first one we're gonna talk about is what we call allopatric speciation. So allopatric speciation is, um, the word itself means other country. So with allopatric speciation, we are talking about an interruption, usually due to a physical barrier or a physical separation of organisms within a species from each other. So they're being separated from each other if you look at this picture, perhaps initially we had a big lake. Okay, so you have a big lake where all of these fish are living with each other, they are randomly mating with each other, and perhaps we have a drought that takes place. And when we have this drought, um, there's a lot of uh, land that now becomes dry land, and this separates that large lake into smaller bodies of water. Once we have the smaller bodies of water, these fish are no longer able to randomly mate with each other. If they're no longer able to randomly mate with each other, now we have no gene flow between the two. And they're able to independently uh, evolve from each other because of natural selection. So there may be predators in one location that are not present in another. There may be different environmental factors that come into play with their natural selection but they independently evolve, they independently change from each other, such that if years later, we have a lot of water again, a lot of rain, and this forms into one main lake, these no longer are able to actually interbreed with each other. And what may isolate them could be any of those reproductive barriers that we talked about before. Maybe they're no longer interested in each other. Maybe their mate preference has changed. Maybe their food preference has changed so that they're no longer occupying, say, the same depth of water. So a lot of different things could happen there, but the key with allopatric speciation is that they were separated so that they were able to independently evolve from one another. Here's another example. We have these beetles that are multiple different colors. Perhaps there is some type of physical barrier, such as a river that forms down the middle. And if we're talking about beetles, maybe this species or this group is not able to actually fly. So they may be isolated on two different sides. This enables them to independently evolve in response to natural selection. We can also throw things like genetic drift in there, random events that may take place but they're isolated gene pools at this point, and when that river goes away, those gene pools may be so diverged that the two individual populations no longer are going to interbreed with each other. That's allopatric speciation. That's one way that we can get new species to form, and perhaps that's the most obvious way that a new species would form. We can also have what we call sympatric speciation. And sympatric 
means same country. So in this case, we're going to take individuals, they're going to stay in close proximity with one another, but for some reason, they're going to stop exchanging genes with each other.